Uh, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> uh, Senator Kyle, Congressman Shattuck, uh, I'm happy that this uh, episode of Firing Line uh, is taking place in, in Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> From this uh, soil, Barry Goldwater sprang, and to this soil he is uh, Return, but his memory is uh, evergreen. And uh, my guest today is also known for having uh, written and spoken about this man and his uh, times. Uh, Christopher Buckley is, of course, uh, primarily known for his gifts as a humorist. His most uh, recent book is called Florence of Arabia. <laughs> Mr. Buckley, that's a hell of a title, and I'm glad your novel lives up to it. <laughs> Uh, this is Mr. Buckley's 11th book, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> one w would be justified in supposing that that is all that he does, write books. But he is, uh, of course, uh, the editor of FYI, the Forbes uh, supplement, that tells us um, what it is in life that we do not have to be unhappy about, because <clears throat> here is a catalog of celebrations to travel, to reading, to wine, to adventure. The idea of FYI was that, uh, was that of the late Malcolm Forbes, who hired our guest as the founding editor of A Quarterly Wit, unhappily Mr. Forbes did not live himself to celebrate. The magazine was an instant uh, critical success uh, and became even a commercial success and is now published uh, six times a year. There's always for our guest uh, one other thing to do. Uh, he graduated from Yale University in 1975 and looked about for a way to uh, practice his skills as a journalist, cultivated as an undergraduate. The stars were interacting happily because he was offered a junior editorship in Esquire magazine the very day he set out uh, in the cold competitive world. <clears throat> Six months later he was offered the post of managing editor of Esquire. He held on there until the call came from Washington DC. Would he accept a job as speechwriter for Vice President George Bush? It was a happy and successful tour of duty uh, which came along as his books began appearing on the scene. The first of these, The, the White House Mess, is a roaring comedy. It was uh, followed by Thank You for Smoking, <laughs> and then by No Way to Treat a First Lady, and uh, other books which uh, caused him to be named the leading satirist in America, and brought him two months ago the James Thurber Award for American Humor. As we uh, meet here today, Hollywood is engaged in making two of the novels into films, which I pause to remark is more than Hollywood has ever done for our host here today. <clears throat> <clears throat> Who nevertheless continues to uh, publish books, most recently an autobiography miles gone by. We will touch on a number of uh, <clears throat> a number of subjects on this fine line episode. We will, for instance, um, explore the question of the legacy of Senator Goldwater, taking satisfaction in the auspices of today's event, sponsored by the Goldwater Institute. And of course, as always, I will open up the floor in the event that there is a uh, any subject on which Mr. Buck and I have left any doubt. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I suspect that our guest, uh, I expect our guest to, to express uh, his views on the most recent uh, elections, on matters of political division within the Republican Party, and on lingering questions having to do with social matters on which Senator Goldwater touched down late in life, not always with the unanimous enthusiasm of his constituents. 
So then, Mr. Buckley, what is the special magic of the Goldwater name? Thank you for that introduction, Mr. Buckley. <laughs> And I would, I would like to say how very pleased I am to be here on Firing Line only five years after Firing Line ended. <laughs> A great honor. <laughs> Secondly, I would be remiss if I did not say uh, how pleased I am to be here again at the Goldwater Institute and in Phoenix when I was writing speeches for <clears throat> Vice President George H. W. Bush, as one now has to refer to him. And if he was giving an out-of-town speech, he would usually like to begin it with the line, it's great to be here in Phoenix, here in the real America. This, this showed that you were not a Washington insider, even if you were Vice President. Uh, one time, by mistake, I left the line in a speech that he delivered in Toronto. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and that went over really well. Uh, now, Mr. Buckley, as to your question, um, the name Goldwater is... Um, is, is, is a very rich one. It, uh, I think, uh, denotes the very wellspring of uh, modern uh, conservatism, or as you would put it, Mr. Buckley, the Fonz et Origo. <laughs> but um, you could, uh, it could be said that um, uh, I think it's always a good rule to butter up the the questioner, that uh, in a sense uh, Buckley begat Goldwater and Goldwater begat Reagan and Reagan begat Bush and boy did Bush begat Bush. <laughs> and what, uh, what Bush will begat, well, that remains the question. I hope I have answered the question, Mr. Buckley, to your satisfaction. Let me in, in, interrupt your running stream of commentary <laughs> by asking, why, long, why did it take you so long to qualify to appear on firing lines? <laughs> Well, Mr. Buckley, I, I grew up in, uh, in difficult circumstances. <laughs> And I, and I had many handicaps to, uh, <laughs> to overcome, but I feel finally at 52 that I have uh, arrived in, 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 uh, in, in that sense. I hope that uh, answers your question. Well, uh, let, let me ask you this. Uh, you having worked in such close quarters with uh, President H. W. Bush, <clears throat> uh, we, we, we know, and you know, the special uh, animosity directed towards Senator Goldwater during a, a part of his lifetime and his career. But I, I've heard you remark that the animosity towards the President Bush uh, is uh, more ardent than any animosity you previously detected in your, to be sure, short career in public life. <laughs> How, uh, if this is so, how do you account for it? Uh, there is something about our president that uh, just drives people uh, nuts, uh, although <laughs> those people tend to be in the blue states. He, um, he is, um, he is um, a, a man of, of supreme, I think, self-confidence. Perhaps this comes of his personal background. The president is, by his own admission and declaration, a born-again Christian and a recovering alcoholic. Uh, those are not small parts of anyone's personality. I speak as an unrecovering alcoholic myself. <laughs> and is a very poor Christian. Uh, 
but his, uh, his confidence is, his self-confidence is at times bracing. It was bracing in the days following his re-election where uh, he sort of uh, paused briefly to say, well, let us bind up the nation's wounds and then declared that he was the possessor of an enormous amount of political capital, which, by God, he planned to spend. I was uh, listening to him speak, I was reminded of Mark Twain's uh, line about that there is no optimist like a Christian holding four aces. <laughs> The, uh, that uh, that uh, animosity is, is in part for some reason generated personally, but it's also uh, partly attributed to the uh, Iraqi venture. Uh, I have um, here in Phoenix heard uh, a number of people pose the following question. Conservative politics uh, is associated, and probably so, with realism. Uh, and that uh, realism necessarily uh, necessarily confines American uh, idealism. Traditionally, American idealism was exerted uh, abroad only with very specific reference to our uh, national interest. But it's also true that we have deviated from that, most probably, most explicitly with uh, Woodrow Wilson, who saw that America had a responsibility to bring democracy uh, to the world, and very emphatically with John F. Kennedy, who said that we would undertake to bear any sacrifice, whatever, to uh, spread liberty uh, abroad. Now, the, the experience in Vietnam diluted that uh, enthusiasm for, uh, for um, uh, exporting uh, our uh, idealism, but it was revived under the, under the shelter of self-protection. What it seems to me that uh, President Bush has not succeeded in doing, if indeed it was ever his intent to do so, to conjoin that uh, idealism with that traditional delimiting sense of uh, realism. And I, I wonder, whether you think that's because he has been careless on the subject or whether you think it's in fact not uh, doable. Thank you for that concise question. <laughs> <laughs> Which I will answer in nine parts. <laughs> <laughs> or as George Will would say, seriatim. <laughs> um, I don't, my sense uh, of, of the president is, is, is not one of enormous uh, um, intellectual or historical curiosity. Uh, I don't say that disparagingly. Uh, and uh, I point out that he was uh, shown in the final weeks of the campaign to have had a higher IQ than John Kerry. Uh, you know, let me try to answer the question this way. There's, uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen a number of departures from the president's cabinet. And, uh, and there's also been discussion about adding a new cabinet secretary. Uh, that always seems to be the solution to things. Uh, uh, Senator, I almost said President Kerry. Senator Kerry during the campaign actually called for a Department of Wellness, <laughs> which meant, I guess, there would be a Secretary of Wellness. And, uh, man, would that be a great job for me. <laughs> Though I, I, I would, uh, before we proceeded with having a Secretary of Wellness, I, I think it should be established where the Secretary of Wellness would fall in the line of presidential succession. <laughs> uh, the, secretary, the cabinet level secretary I would propose, Mr. Buckley, and I apologize for this long answer, would be sec the Secretary of History. And uh, the Secretary of History would sit there at the cabinet table, and when the President said, you know, I think really we ought to invade Iraq. And the Secretary of History would cough softly like Jeeves, that sort of which 
P.G. Woodhouse described as like the soft cough of a sheep, of an aged sheep on a distant mountaintop. <laughs> <laughs> and the president would turn to the Secretary of History and, and the Secretary You're getting of History. You're pretty poetic in your nine verses. Not bad, yeah. <laughs> So I'm only up to p the fourth part. <laughs> and uh, the president would say, well, uh, the secretary of history would say, well, sir, uh, the British uh, did that in 1919. And the president would say, well, how did it turn out? Uh, well, not so well, sir. <laughs> uh, so I think a, a little bit of uh, forethought or uh, Maybe you would call it uh, arrière pensée. Uh, might have 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 been an order. I, I heard a distinguished, elder conservative statesman tell a, a TV reporter earlier today that uh, he did not think it was a failing a failing to say after something had gone wrong that we hadn't foreseen that. Yes, I think that's a <coughs> that's the point that <coughs> perhaps ought to be reiterated. Some time ago, in an exchange with the New York Times, I, I mentioned that uh, I, would be, I had been in favor of the initiative in Iraq, but that I, if, I, if I knew then what I know now, I would have thought differently about it. Now, this uh, struck a lot of people as an act of uh, infidelity. I said, no, no, it was not unfaithful because, in my own judgment, what President Bush did at the time was justified on the basis of what we then knew. But to suggest that uh, one automatically should be committed to tactic A, when uh, a year or two later it turns out that tactic A did not take sufficient advantage of variable circumstances, is, is, is not, it's not very bright. Now, I think that uh, if Mr. Rumsfeld were here, or Mr. Bush, probably they would say, well, we were right then, we were right the next day, and we were right the day after. But that's a matter of pride. And uh, uh, pride isn't as satisfactory at the service of a reordered uh, thought. Quite. Quite. <laughs> Shall I say that again? If you would, I... <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, well, to put an extreme case on it, the Japanese wouldn't have bombed Pearl Harbor if they had known what was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, if, if, we, if we now stretch beyond the, uh, beyond the perspective of uh, Vietnam, a question that I have heard from members of the Goldwater Institute in Phoenix is, how, uh, how can we... Uh, how, can we, uh, 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 how can we reconcile ourselves to Mr. Bush being a conservative, given the extent to which he has been permissive on the subject of uh, deficit uh, spending? Give me, give me a, a quick reaction on that point before I press you further. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> A, uh, a wise senior conservative intellectual uh, was asked four years ago uh, whether or not uh, George W. Bush was a conservative. And I believe this wise, not quite then elder intellectual conservative said, well, he's a conservative, but not a conservative. And I think there is uh, a huge difference. It, it is as a, uh, I really Gould wish... Goldwater would have been a conservative, right? Abs well, And Reagan would have been a conservative. <laughs> Bush would have been simply conservative. Conservative, yeah. Uh, I think you could probably use the definite article with Barry Goldwater or Ronald Reagan yeah. as in the conservative. Uh, but there's a difference. As, a, um, as someone who was uh, brought up, uh, amidst uh, strict conservative and even Republican principles that, uh, you know, the Republican Party was the, the daddy party, it was the, it was the responsible party that uh, made you make your bed and wash the car and you got your allowance. Uh, uh, I was, uh, I confess to some dismay when I, I, at a not quite ringside but sort of upper loge seat in the early 
uh, Reagan administration, I saw these deficits <laughs> getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and David Stockman would come in. I would see David Stockman going down the hallway in the old executive office building with his hair getting grayer by the minute, <laughs> holding these enormous <laughs> briefing books. And, um, and, and the deficits got bigger and bigger, and, uh, and, and, uh, and they have... Criticizing R. Reagan. <sighs> Where were you born? I come... Uh, <laughs> well, as I, I told you, I had a very difficult home life. Uh, <laughs> but my point is that uh, something went kind of uh, askew uh, with the Republican ideal. Uh, if uh, there was a... Um, there was a spending bill, Mr. Buckley, passed. Uh, do you, I don't know if you read the New York Times because it's a, as you know, but it's a liberal paper published in, in New York. Uh, uh, there was a, a spending bill passed uh, a, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and it uh, it's it, it was a 388 billion dollar spending bill, and uh, Joe Klein referred to it as a a luau, <laughs> uh, which I thought was a, a charming word. And, and uh, now this was passed by a Republican Congress and by Republican Senate. Now let me just uh, tick off, Mr. Buckley, for your uh, edification. Uh, a couple of the items... No, but uh, you know, you take what you can get. Um, some of the some of the items in this, and let let us let us address these questions to the to the uh, revered ghost of Barry Goldwater, and uh, who can be play the role of King Hamlet, uh, stalking the parapets behind us. And let's let's ask our, ask the ghost of Barry Goldwater what he would have thought of um, grants included in this spending bill for to study berries in Alaska wine in Washington, and maple syrup in Vermont. $25,000 for schools in Las Vegas to study the development of the mariachi music. $300,000 to Missoula, Montana for the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. $100,000 to Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania for a weather museum. It, it, um, uh, uh, now, is this just the way it works, or or would uh, would William Buckley, were he here, uh, uh, look on this with with uh, with with some uh, sense of historical dismay? Well, uh, uh, permit me, uh, mutatis mutandis, the kind of thing. That <laughs> I was you, hoping you'd say that. <laughs> the kind of thing that you recited, uh, you could have recited, as I say, mutatis mutandis. <laughs> under the Jefferson administration. Pork is as old as the Republic. The question is, is pork excessive? The excessiveness of pork can't be singularized by merely mentioning uh, the need for Montana research on their, their health system. But the, dis the, the, dis the, the distinction that I think conservatives need to abide by, and I think Senator Goldwater would, would have agreed with this, is that deficit spending is okay if it's a national emergency or if there's an economic purpose. It's pretty well uh, acknowledged by conservative uh, historians that uh, President Hoover made a terrible mistake when he uh, refused to engage in deficit spending or, or to lower taxation uh, after two or three years of, uh, of depression. If, uh, uh, if deficit spending needs to be made in order to attempt to revive uh, uh, an economy, uh, as Lord Keynes here and there, I think, persuasively documented, do it, but do it as an exercise in the economy. Don't do it simply as, as an act of self indulgence. Right. And uh, I think. What, what's been going on in the last few years, much of it is, is self-indulgent. Now, I think President Bush said a few days ago, signifying a turn of a voice on the subject, uh, and uh, maybe uh, Senator Kyle 
uh, or Congressman Sadek uh, caught this, you know, if you people want to come up with other ideas, fresh ideas for federal activity, come up with corresponding forms of financing them. And that, uh, that tends to cool, uh, cool things down. But one is, I think, uh, entitled to ask, uh, or is a president abdicating fundamental conservative commitments uh, if he seems to lose any handle on deficit spending? Oh, well, I would say the answer is yes. I, 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 uh, conservatism, it seems to me, has been reduced to a, uh, a, a sort of a subset of of, of cultural symbols, gun ownership, uh, church membership, um, a stance on abortion, say these are, these have become sort of flashcards, but, uh, but I, 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 I sense a, uh, a, a lack of connective tissue between these. Bill Clinton, and how nice it was to have him back at the uh, opening of the Clinton Library, said that the, the election was about uh, guns, gay marriage, and abortion. I, I don't take that as necessarily dispositive, but I think, as, as you would say, uh, but I think it's, uh, he's, a, he's an astute politician, and I think, um, I think it was uh, worth, worth noting. Well, so, uh, touching on, on these uh, social conservative issues, um, I, I, think, uh, I think people in Phoenix would, among others, acknowledge that uh, Senator Goldwater in the last few years uh, surprised some of his constituents by, in effect, uh, acknowledging almost morally the supremacy of the Supreme Court. By which I mean it's one thing to say, well, the Supreme Court has ended the question, they voted that way. It's another thing, I think, to say the Supreme Court has uh, ended that question. Plus, also, it's made a commitment which binds me morally. I remember uh, uh, Senator, um, who ran in 72. M McGovern? Yeah. He was, uh, he was walking down for his first press conference after he was named candidate. And somebody said to him, Senator, What's your position on busing? <laughs> he said, well, the Supreme Court hasn't been heard on the subject yet. Yeah, that's... that's uh... And my question was, one has a position on busing, irrespective of what the Supreme Court yeah, uh, says yeah. it does. But uh, Senator Goldwater, in, in my judgment, in his uh, rather accommodationist positions on the matter of uh, gay issues and, uh, uh, and, and church state, seemed, seemed to be capitulating by giving the Supreme Court, as I say, not only finite uh, constitutional allegiance, but also what seemed to be moral allegiance. I just heard a rumbling up on the parapet. I think he's, he's, <coughs> he's hurling bread rolls. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, you asked, Mr. Buckley, uh, what, what it is that drives uh, blue pe Americans so nutty about uh, President Bush, and, and surely a large component of that is, uh, this has to do with the Supreme Court. We have skulls in the Smithsonian that are more recent than most Supreme Court justices. <laughs> and and it's, it's driving uh, blue America even bluer that um, President Bush may appoint as many as four Supreme Court justices. Now, I don't know, Mr. Buckley, why uh, Blue America should be so upset about this inasmuch as President Bush emphatically, during the third presidential debate, absolutely ruled out the prospect of his appointing a pro-slavery justice to the Supreme Court. <laughs> so, uh, I, I really think they just ought to chill out. <laughs> well, that was of course a that was of course a uh, 
a crisis posed by the Dred Scott decision. <clears throat> Indeed. The, uh, the author of, of that decision uh, held on to his views, and uh, they had to be observed as a matter of constitutional law. But uh, Lincoln was very direct in saying that he disagreed with the reasoning that led to Dred Scott. He didn't challenge the authority of the court. He said that the court was, was mistaken. And that, that was considered a, a legitimate uh, position. I haven't heard, beyond certain scholarly uh, quarters, I haven't heard people say prominently, the Supreme Court was mistaken in Roe v. Wade, i.e. it uh, waded into a subject and reached certain conclusions which uh, not only were extra-constitutional, but uh, usurped the uh, plebiscitary resources of America which would have permitted individual states to make judgments on uh, such issues on their own. Do you, do you find that uh, disappointing well, or are you too uh, resigned? Well, well I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I am resigned actually to Roe v. Wade. The figures are that about only 25% of Americans want abortion to be illegal. And I think that's the fact of life. Uh, you and I are Catholics, and uh, and I very much am a Catholic because of you. Uh, uh, how, <clears throat> however, much a disappointment to the monks who, with whom I stayed for four years. But um, the fact, the the these the figures within our faith are roughly. Last time I looked, that some 80 percent of American Catholics. Are, are at peace with abortion being but that's legal. But that's infidelity. Uh, you can call it infidelity. Well, why not call it infidelity? Well, why not? I mean, if they, but, tell, you, if they tell you to go to church, you need to go to church, that's infidelity. No, 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 I, no I, 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 I grant that, but I'm, I'm merely proffering uh, respectfully. How could it be otherwise? Well, uh, the, uh, the, <laughs> the, the, these, these statistical hard, hard facts. Uh, uh, there are many Catholics, they're called cafeteria Catholics, and I guess pr preeminently uh, Senator Kerry was one. I, I love, a, I love in being in a conversation with a Catholic who says, you know, I'm, I'm Catholic, uh, quite, but I don't need the Pope to tell me something, and I don't need the Bishop to tell me something, and I don't need some priest to tell me anything. And I don't believe in abortion. I mean, I believe in abortion, and I believe in gay, gay marriage. And they've, by the time they get to the end of this list, <laughs> you're left to handing them a, a, an, a, an entry uh, form for the Unitarian Church. <laughs> uh, and, and yet they, they, they persist in considering themselves uh, cultural, yeah, cultural that, that, Catholics. That, that is a, a cultural point, but I, what I think uh, uh, you are not confronting by simply giving a, uh, by simply giving nationwide statistics is that uh, uh, the, the United States, uh, the individual states are divided on this issue. For instance, Missouri. Uh, Missouri is against uh, abortion and if there were a vote taken tomorrow on whether you could have an abortion in Missouri, they'd vote no, you can't. <laughs> now, that imposes how much of a hardship? A bus ride to a neighboring state. Uh, Connecticut Connecticut is very, very preemptively liberal. Two years ago, passed. You mean, despite your 52, <laughs> no, your 80-year residence in Connecticut. Yeah. Uh, how c Connecticut passed uh, passed a law. I kid you not, saying we don't think Roe v. Wade is going to be overturned. But this is uh, this is a law that says if it is overturned, returning to Connecticut, the authority on the subject, we want to say we right now ordain that anybody wants an abortion can proceed to have so. Have one now. But that's, that's the way federalism works and, and should work. Individual states uh, express their own preferences. Somebody drew a map for me of how many states would probably authorize abortion if it were, if its constitutionality were repealed tomorrow. And the answer was about two thirds. And as I say, the, the one third like, like Missouri who would stand uh, athwart the idea would was subjected individuals to inconveniences. Now, uh, 
what we are confronted with, my judgment, and here I wish Senator Goldwater had opined specifically on it, is what have we, what have we invited by, by the constitutional preemption of the issue by the Supreme Court? What, what, what kind of placidity has resulted from a, you know, a Dred Scott decision of, of 1973? Well, what were... Uh what were Senator Goldwater's views on that specific issue, on abortion? Uh, uh, did, he, did he acquiesce in uh, Roe I'm v. Wade? I'm sure there are people... There must be someone here who knows the answer to this question. But, well, I'm, uh, I'm, sure there, um, there, I'm sure there are people in this room who heard him express himself on that subject. I heard him express himself mm -hmm. only on the subject of Roe v. Roe v. Wade has been decided. Mm -hmm. But that's a little bit like, are you in favor of buzzing? Well, well, what Ro, the legacy that Roe v. Wade has given us is, uh, uh, is, 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 is a very polarizing one, and it's going to be expressed perhaps as many as four, four times uh, during the next four years. Uh, there, this, this is the appointments of the Supreme Court justices are probably going to turn into spectacles that make the harshest moments of campaign 2004 uh, look like Victorian tea parties. And it all, I think, traces back really to the, to the Bork uh, nomination hearings where you had the, um, where I, I think uh, 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 levels of incivility and, and disingenuousness and, and, and viciousness attained new heights or lows, depending on, on how you want to look at them. Well, Mr. Buck, I don't want to pretend that I'm in the least uh, uh, put off by your making up all those lost years when you weren't on firing line. <laughs> but, uh, and I have mentioned the publication of your book, uh, Thank you. Taking care of my obligations as a host, but there are <laughs> there are people I've been told in Phoenix who would like to ask some questions, so we turn the floor over to them. Yes, 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 sir. Yes, ma'am. I was interested in what, um, what you would say was your uh, most significant disagreement. Politically? <laughs> our, what was our most significant disagreement I think politically? I think that has to do that of order. Well, I, I can tell you that he... You can tell me where I'm all wet, but don't say that it's a disagreement. I can, I can tell you that uh, when it was discovered that I was smoking cigarettes at the age of 15, I was told that I would not have the requisite parental signature on my driver's license application. <laughs> that was uh, one of those difficult circumstances I alluded to uh, earlier. <laughs> There was a That's the ultimate sanction in America, to get in the way of a driver's license for a 16-year-old. <laughs> uh, so over here, oh, I thought, thought you raised your hand, sorry. Yes, sir. What is your uh, opinion on Cuba and, and the relationships that we have with Cuba and why we haven't opened up, which obviously has helped with other communist countries? Uh, in, in my judgment, uh, our position on Cuba is uh, is um, indecipherable, by which I mean it makes no sense whatsoever. Right. Our, uh, we, we were correctly mobilized against Cuba when Cuba was a salient of an international uh, Soviet imperialism. The minute that ended, in my judgment, we had no further political concern for Cuba beyond our concern for the lack of freedom, which uh, uh, is a concern that we were able to manage by recognizing North Vietnam. The only reason we have continuing boycotts against Cuba 
is because there's a hard constituency in Miami and in New Jersey that asks for it. And the second is a matter of pride. We uh, instituted that boycott. Castro still lives, and he shouldn't do that given how we have expressed ourselves on, on the subject. Did you it, want to... It, it's, well, it's, I think it's, it boils down to 24 electoral votes in Florida. I think it's... And, and uh, to deny that that is the reality requires uh, more contortions than you would see at a showing of Cirque du Soleil. <laughs> uh, it, it is... No, I think incoherent is, is, is a perfect word for it. You need, it seems to me, a certain moral authority to be able to propose regularizing relations with a country that has been inimical. Inimical. I'm using a lot of WFD words to <laughs> I practice in front of a mirror. Yeah. Uh, it, took, it took John McCain to propose normalizing relations with North Vietnam. No one could question John McCain on that score, just as, in a way, pari passu or mutatis mutandis, it took a Nixon to open up China. Uh, you, 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 generals to end wars. Or generals to end yeah. wars. Okay, we have a question over here. Yes, uh, who uh, is the next political conservative who will lead our nation in the future? Uh, well, it ain't going to be me. <laughs> I, I am I'm, I'm the most vacuous person in public America on the matter of um, political prophecies. I never, ever, ever know what's going to happen. And I don't know who's going to uh, assume the leadership, I think there are people in this room who do know, I don't see a presence, I don't see a, um, <clears throat> I don't see a, su a successor who uh, is, is <clears throat> mobilizing uh, support <clears throat> as uh, logically to be, um, logically to be nominated after Mr. Bush is, is out. Uh, uh, do you? Well, there's a very attractive young Arizona Congressman, uh, movie star, handsome, named Jeff Flake. I think he'd, uh, if he wants to, uh, I'll, uh, <clears throat> um, I'll come speak at a fundraiser for him if, uh, if that happens. I think the, the uh, I, I, I agree in that there are no, um, you know, it's terribly hard to know how things are going to turn out in America. It's very. The saying is, a week in politics is an eternity. If in 1991 I had said to you, okay, um, I'll bet you that a president with an approval rating of 90% who has just won a spectacularly efficient war in the Gulf and defeated a tyrant in 100 hours will lose re-election to a horny governor from Arkansas. <laughs> Uh, would you take that back? If, uh, if, if in 1996 I said to you, okay, a, a sex scandal involving a Democratic President of the United States is going to result in the resignation of not one but two Republican Speakers of the House, uh, would you have taken that back? Uh, if in, in 2000 I said, uh, that uh, George W. Bush would be elected President of the United States by 1,400 confused Democratic retirees in Palm Beach <laughs> who okay, voted for Pat Buchanan by mistake. <laughs> yeah. Jews for Buchanan. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, we can would you have taken that bet? We have a question right over here. But I'm not finished. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Buckley Sr., you really were in at the beginning of the war of ideas from the right. And I would say it is clear that 
your side, our side, has won the war of ideas, but when we see Republicans not only addicted to pork, but to passing basically democratic uh, bills, I'm thinking of Medicare pre prescription drugs, we have lost the war of policy. Do you think we can ever win the war of policy as we have won the war of ideas? Uh, it's, it's very difficult in my judgment uh, to have confidence in that for the very simple reason that uh, the, the burden on conservatives is always considerably larger than the burden on liberals uh, in, in respect of um, policy because, uh, because the liberals uh, can say, well, let's, let's, let's have free health. Uh, the conservatives say, well, no, you can't, you can't just have free health. You've got you to work for it. You've got to save. You've got to deploy your forces. But uh, to maintain that up against, let's have free health, is a rhetorical disadvantage which simply doesn't go away. Barry Goldwater told me once, God, it's a long time. He said, you know, Bill, I think the way we're going now on public health, we stand a chance of a deficit of five billion dollars. <laughs> uh, uh, now that that was the figure in sight in his sights in the you know, late fifties, early early sixties, and uh, of course again mutatis mutandis, that figure has sprung enormously. But but <clears throat> it's extremely hard uh, to take the conservative position uh, up against the liberal alternative when it seems to be relatively uninspired and relatively unmagnanimous. We take the position which is widely understood. In order to know how to read, you've got to learn the alphabet. Well, this, this is accepted because there's no way to gainsay that, something that's that obvious. But to say, <clears throat> We, we, we're going to have a social security uh, at age uh, 65 saying just that <clears throat> without feeling a responsibility to document how you're going to finance it is uh, put you at historical disadvantage with somebody who neglects the cost and stresses only the desire. PJ, yes. let me just add yeah. one thing. PJ O'Rourke, who's a very fine writer and fine thinker and who's spoken to this uh, forum, has a very nice line on that. He said, if you think uh, health care is expensive now, just wait till it's free. <laughs> yeah. And you could apply that, it seems to me, to a, an awful lot of government spending uh, uh, principles. I think At the United Nations, when I hear those words, I can think of a lot of failures. Uh, what is the United States, or what is the United Nations doing, uh, and can it be resurrected? Uh, you want to take that? Yeah. Well, you served as a delegate at the United Nations, so I think on this one I'll defer to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the, the United Nations, from its inception, uh, was. Uh, uh, morally hogtied. It, uh, it acknowledged uh, as permanent, from permanent membership um, a power, the Soviet Union, which was manifestly uh, devoted to undermining all of the ideals expressed in San Francisco. So what happened over the years was that uh, uh, it became useful only really as an instrumental medium by which certain things could be accomplished that required phone calls and uh, <laughs> sub-agreements. You know, if, you, if you want to decide what the radio station in Rio should limit its range to, the UN's a good place to go. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, that's, that's right. Now, we, the, the, the uh, proposal made in National Review by James Burnham 30 years ago was that uh, the United States beg out of its uh, moral conundrum by taking the following position. The American delegate will never vote in the General Assembly. Will argue, persuade, threaten, beguile, but it won't ever vote. If, if that were to happen, it would strip the General Assembly 
of that false moral leverage that it attempts to exhibit at moments when it has absolutely no authority to do so. I think that's a very sensible mm. uh, reform and makes, makes me, as I say, make, makes more, more sense than merely the pulling out of, of the United Nations uh, in, in part because I say there are things that the United Nations uniquely uh, can do. Yes. Am I put? Yes. Hi. At the rear of the room? A sea of hands. It seems that from the beginning of our country, we had sort of a, a, a presumption of liberty. Over the last 50 or 60 years, it, through conservative or probably more liberal, but both or cooperation of both, we seem to have moved away from that presumption of, of liberty to a presumption of, of, govern, of authority in government. How do we get back there? Well, we have to, uh, until we get to the point where they're not take, asking us to take off our shoes at the airport, <laughs> I, I despair. Um, the, uh, the, one of surely the pillars of the conservative uh, <clears throat> temple is individual liberty. Uh, the emphasis on the individual over the group or the state uh, in a in, 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 in a war uh, the individual is obviously subject to uh, to such such pressures um, if you're referring specifically to the Patriot Act I think I think um, there, there was a lot of uh, a lot of fuss made uh, on the left during the campaign about the Patriot Act as though this was this had enabled the you know it, it, to the left the dark night of fascism is always descending on America um, and the people decrying the dark night of fascism descending on America can usually be found on stage at the town hall in New York City uh, decrying it so uh, I'm uh, obviously less concerned about it than um, than, than some others. But uh, what I what I do uh, this is perhaps tangential to your point. But I, I do uh, I, I am saddened by I, I live in Washington and I am saddened by the apparatus of government these days. These. 80 car long motorcades and these uh, these phalanxes of praetorians and and these these jersey barriers and i think they ex these you know the, just assuming that anything you're typing on your computer is being read by someone or perhaps i flatter myself that anyone <laughs> really cares about my emails but um, a, a certain, let's face it, a certain amount of big brotherism, I think, has has crept into our lives, and it's uh, it's uh, I'm I'm very um, I'm regretful about that. There's time for one more question. I've been signaled by management. Yes, sir. Paul Kennedy. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the argument, the gist of the book is that the great powers begin their descent. Uh, the great powers begin their descent into history when they overextend their influence beyond their economic base. Um, is our involvement in Iraq, which, by the way, uh, Mr. Buckley, I, I greatly appreciate uh, your summary of that, of the rationality of going in. Uh, it seems to have been forgotten by, by many. But uh, is our involvement in Iraq the prologue uh, to our dissent? Um, or is this something it was a necessary evil that we should recover from? And, uh, or for that matter, is our war on terrorism uh, likely to be begin our descent into history because of the phenomenal economic cost? Well, I, I, I think one has to acknowledge rather despondently what I have in, in, in other contexts labeled the 
skydrackers leverage. One person, uh, there are those who say, we grant this problem, and it's a problem that uh, rises precipitately with the urbanization of America. The, the threat in a city of uh, 300,000 is infinitely greater than in a city of 30,000 people because of the skydrackers' uh, leverage. There is no way that I can think of, and I don't think that there's any way that John Stuart Mill thought his way out of that particular uh, problem. The presumptions have to be uh, correct. And uh, those, those presumptions are that the safety of the individual is the superordinate responsibility of the state. Whatever the state needs to do to guarantee your individual freedom, it has a license to do. Then, uh, as Chris would say, quis custodit ipsos custodes. <laughs> Who will watch the people who watch over us? You and took that the words is, of course, right the problem with which I, I leave you all with many thanks to the Goldwater Institute for your hospitality. Excuse me, can I, can I clarify one thing on behalf of the Goldwater family? Um, you said Senator Goldwater was actually pro-choice. Um, I just to clarify your rule. Yeah, we're, the evening is over, Mr. Yeah. I thought there would be at least one person in this room who knew the answer to that. <laughs> Your last name wouldn't be Goldwater, would it? <laughs>